Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of World Water Week 2024. It is our pleasure to host our the second panel that responded to our call for papers. The panel is entitled Breaking Barriers, Navigating Public Acceptance of Direct Potable Reuse. And the speakers and organizers are Dr. Yvonne Santiago, Dr. Camila Madeira, and Dr. Lauren Kennedy. Thank you so much. Can I get started? Yes, Yvonne, you can. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, um, people in the audience and our participants uh, via Zoom. Um, today, we're going to delve into a topic that is of critical importance and of timely relevance. Um, we called it Breaking Barriers, Navigating Public Acceptance of Direct Potable uh, Reuse. And as climate change continues to challenge our traditional water sources with extreme water patterns and also unpredictable rains uh, and prolonged droughts, uh, the urgency for a sustainable water supply has become even more pressing. So direct potable reuse represents a groundbreaking opportunity to secure our water future, but it, its acceptance hinges not only on technological viability, but overcoming public skepticism and also regulatory hurdles, especially in Texas, where we don't have a specific procedure for direct potable reuse. In our session, we will explore the challenges, strategies, and success stories in garnering public support for direct potable reuse and just as a as uh, a preview, we refer to it as DPR. So whenever uh, inadvertently we use DPR, we refer to direct potable reuse. So we're going to be demonstrating its role in sustaining uh, a public water supply and uh, as a key uh, feature in the adaptation of climate change. So <clears throat> with that introduction, I would like to also present our uh, speakers. Uh, I'll let Dr. Camila Madeira and Lauren Kennedy introduce themselves. Camila. Thank you very much, Dr. Santiago. Uh, my name is Camila Madeira, and I started as an assistant professor in, in the Department of Civil Engineering in September last year. And my research has been focused on wastewater treatment, especially using microorganisms to break down contaminants and also on, on bioremediation of contaminants of concern. Thank you, Camila. Lauren? Hi, everyone. I'm Lauren Kennedy. I just started in the Department of Civil Engineering in January, and I am particularly interested in direct potable reuse and how microorganisms in particular can be removed from the water in order to ensure that it is safe for drinking. I'm also interested in microorganisms in the engineered water cycle in particular. Thank you. And then Dr. Eva Diemer, who contributed to this presentation, cannot talk, but she's a research assistant professor uh, in the Department of Civil Engineering. And then I am Yvonne Santiago. I'm associate professor in the Department of Civil Engineering. And my research focuses on equity issues related to access to safe drinking water and also to clean transportation, amongst other things. And then uh, development of technologies, low-cost technologies to provide safe drinking water to underserved communities. So with that, let me get started with uh, a question. So um, if you would be so kind as to join by web or by text, so in your phones, um, provided that you don't have to pay extra for it, type 22333, and then you will join this session by uh, sending a text that says Yvonne Santia 612, and then you can start answering the questions for this session. So we'd like to uh, know your opinion on different issues and uh, I want, we don't have a lot of these, but it, your responses are very important. So the first question is, where does the water at your house come from? And we'll see if you can connect. If you have any issues, please let me know.
we only have one answer so far, and I think that was me. Let me put the instructions here again. Okay, great. Okay. On the south of brown water. Okay. Great. Okay, I don't want to spend too much time on this one because we wanted to know if you knew where where your water comes from, where you live. And depending on where you live and the time of the year is the source of your water. So let's uh, let's move on to the next slide. So uh, after having that answer for uh, where your water comes from, let's talk about the existing water supply in El Paso. And we have two aquifers, uh, the Mesilla Bolson and the Waco Bolson are the two aquifers. We also have surface water from uh, the Rio Grande, so-called compact water. And, uh, but that's not all year long. It's only during the irrigation season, which started a week ago and uh, desalted water. And then of course we have some reclaimed water. So this is the existing water supply in general. Not all of it would be necessarily used for drinking water, but these are, this is the, the portfolio of water supply that we have in El Paso. And I wanted to say that if you have any questions at any point, you know, uh, please write your questions on the chat if you are online or, uh, you know, make sure that you let uh, Camila or Lauren uh, know that you have a question. Now, as I said, depending on the time of the year is your water supply that's used for your drinking water. And uh, so, you see how we rely heavily on groundwater for the non-irrigation season. So you can see in this graph here, and I have the laser pointer, how most of the water comes from the groundwater during the non-irrigation season. And here it's more or less an average between April and October, November, depending on the water allocation and when they um, let the water flow from uh, Elephant Butte is the source for surface water, but we always rely in some manner to uh, groundwater. And then in the future, right, we want El Paso to grow and not be constrained by availability of water uh, for its growth and economic progress. So uh, we have to diversify the water supply. So there's plans for the future to augment the water supply with uh, groundwater importation from Dell City here. There's two phases, phase one and two. Many years ago, this would not have been possible if it had not been that uh, there was a viable route for piping the water from Dell City to El Paso that did not require significant amounts of pumping. And then of course, the uh, expansion of current Waco Wilson, uh, aquifer storage, recharge programs that El Paso Water has. And then this is a key component here, the advanced water purification at the Bustamante Wastewater Treatment Plant. And we'll hopefully understand that shortly because then Dr. Lauren uh, Kennedy uh, will explain to you what does this mean. So Lauren, can you comment on advanced treatment and the concept of uh, direct potable reuse, number one. And I have a second question. Is purified recycled water being used in other parts of the world? Lauren, the floor is yours. Let me move the slide. Yes, thank you. Uh, first, let's talk a little bit about how the system functions right now. Like what is conventional water treatment in um, the engineered water cycle? So what this slide is showing you is that um, the water that you get from your tap is actually conveyed to you, especially if you're on city water, through a series of pipes called a distribution system. If you'll advance to the next slide. Similarly, uh, your wastewater, anything you put down your sink, um, in your toilet, 
um, anything that is captured by a drain leaves your home in something called the sewer system, which is also a series of pipes. So drinking water and wastewater systems currently function separately. So you'll have a drinking water treatment facility that takes surface water or groundwater, uh, sends it through a series of steps to ensure that it's safe for consumption, and then it delivers it to the distribution system that goes to your home. Similarly, for wastewater treatment, your wastewater is in a separate system where it goes through um, a lower level of treatment and then is put back into the environment in some sort of surface water, usually um, after it's treated. So a one water approach would introduce alternate sources of drinking water. So it would add to the drinking water portfolio that we have right now, um, which just uses surface water or groundwater to add things like wastewater. For this, we need more treatment because wastewater is a really dirty water source, right? It's not as clean as surface water. Surface water also isn't sterile. There's lots of microorganisms in it and chemicals. The same thing goes with wastewater. So we have to add even more treatment before we're able to put it into a distribution system and close this loop. But the loop cannot be completely closed. We're always gonna have some loss in the system. And so we'll always have conventional drinking water coming from a different source that's blended with uh, drinking or with advanced treated wastewater. So Lauren, uh, is purified recycled water being used in other parts of the world? That's a great question. Um, if you'll advance the next slide, Yes, and this is showing you all parts of the world except the United States right now, but I'll also show the United States in a second. But you can see that there's lots of different places that have implemented potable reuse or are planning to or are exploring it. So if it's a black point on this map, it's showing you a point that has planned it or is operating. And if it's a blue point on this map, it's showing you a place that is thinking about it, like they're exploring the idea of it because they do have water issues and they need to add another source of water to their portfolio, which would be wastewater. Um, Singapore is on there. And then if you look at the United States, a lot of the locations are focused in California and Texas, as you can see. Um, these are places with water uh, challenges that we need to have other sources of water in our water portfolios. So I have a question for Camila next. Camila, were there any strategies used to increase public acceptance of recycled water in any of these communities that Lauren has mentioned? Yes, yeah, so um, speaking a little bit about some examples that we have from other countries, I would like to highlight what has been happening in Singapore because it's one of the places where the idea of recycling water has been happening for a long time. So just to give you a little bit of context, um, Singapore, uh, since when it became independent in the 60s, it has been facing water scarcity. So uh, it has very limited water supplies. And Singapore actually imports a lot of its water from Malaysia. And this has been a source of some issues between the two countries. So uh, Singapore decided to start working on their water portfolio and they just started considering other alternatives. So in the 90s, when membrane processes that we will be talking a little bit about later on in, in this panel, so when they became more popular and when finally the technology was to a point that it could be used uh, and it was not cost prohibitive, then uh, Singapore started implementing the use of membrane technologies for both desalination. So uh, that's when you remove salt from the water. So they could uh, use seawater as a water source. And also they started a, a program to recycle their water, uh, which is called new water. And one thing that I, I think is very curious is that from the start, they knew that they had to bring their water. So, um, I imagine some of you are, are familiar with an expression that is called, we were even debating if we should mention it in this panel, uh, toilet to tap. So that's the way that some people refer to recycled water. We don't like this expression because we, we really feel like people are not going to be interested in drinking a water that is that they makes them think about, about toilet, right? So uh, Singapore was very smart. Uh, so. As you can see in one of the photos on the left, then uh, they have the new water. So that's how they decided to bring their, their water. 
So this is water that is treated through uh, very advanced technology, um, mostly including membrane processes. And they also had a, a mascot, uh, which is Water Wally, this little blue drop. And they had this cartoon that um, I think in the 90s, it was very popular. So they would show it on public TV and, and they would teach the kids about uh, water recycling. And it was a great program to make the population aware of um, how the water is treated. And I, I watched some of the episodes and they, they show the, the water drop going through sort of a car wash. So they show all the little treatment steps and it's really interesting. And I'm sure kids growing up seeing this, they are a lot more likely to think of their water as something positive. So I, I think it's a very uh, successful example of how you can teach the, the public that like, okay, we have a very safe source of water and, and make people proud of the technology they have and, and being one of the pioneers in, in using recycled water. But uh, one thing that is important to mention is that um, they recycle their water, but most of it is not for actually potable reuse. So um, a lot of their water is used in industries and they also do what we call indirect potable reuse. So the treated wastewater goes to a reservoir and then it gets mixed with the, the current water supply. And then this water is treated again and sent to people's houses. So that's how it works there. Thank you, Camila. I have a question next for Lauren. Uh, considering that there are other options for water resources, what are the advantages of using direct potable reuse in El Paso specifically? Yeah, so I'll talk about several, but I wanted to start by defining de facto reuse. It's actually not potable when it's de facto reuse because in this case, it's the unplanned use of wastewater as a drinking water source. So this schematic is kind of showing you what that might look like for communities, different cities along a river. So city one here is taking beautiful, clean mountain water and using it for their drinking water. And then their wastewater goes, it goes through conventional treatment and then is put into a river. That river goes downstream to city three, which receives that water. And city two, similarly, um, will put its wastewater into the river that goes to city three. So now city three is exposed to wastewater, but it's not planned. So it doesn't have that those additional treatment steps that are needed in order to ensure the water is safe for consumption. Yeah, and we can add that the same happens with groundwater, right? The water is injected and then someone else pulls it out and uses it for drinking water. That's true. Yeah. This is a map showing um, a, a model of estimating throughout the United States which locations are receiving this de facto reuse water. And so um, the smaller the circle, the less percentage of, of de facto reuse water they're receiving, the bigger the circle, the more. I think it gets up to be about 15% for the red large circles. And you can see El Paso also is a community that is um, uh, using some water that is also contaminated with wastewater. And then this happens throughout the United States. So it's something that we should be thinking about. How do we actually plan to treat that water um, to make it safe for consumption? Well, one way to do that is direct potable reuse. Um, instead of taking that wastewater and putting it into a surface water that is used as a source of drinking water elsewhere, you could take it and treat it through something called full advanced treatment. And this is like a, a more technical slide, but what I'm trying to show you here is that there's multiple different steps to this treatment process. And all of it is more advanced than what we would use in even conventional drinking water, just to make sure that it meets and often exceeds drinking water standards. This includes um, reverse osmosis, which a lot of people might be familiar with for your home water systems. And then I just wanted to make it clear that there are microorganisms in conventional types of water sources. There's microorganisms on this desk, you know, they're everywhere. So there are always going to be some left in water, no matter how much is treated. But the more treatment, the lower the concentration. And we're, we're trying to ensure that pathogens are not in the water. Some microorganisms aren't going to harm us. So what this is showing you is like in, in conventional drinking water, um, if we were to take samples throughout the drinking water facility, we would see at the beginning, there would be a lot of microorganisms from that surface water. 
midway through treatment, there would be fewer. And then at the end, there would be very little. So if we were to quantify that, we might see 100 microorganisms per mil in the surface water. And then it would go to 10 microorganisms per mil after the first few treatment steps. This would be a log reduction value of 1 to go from 100 to 10. Similarly, to go from 100 to 1 at the end of treatment, this is a log reduction value of 2. It's like an order of magnitude assessment. From 1 to 10 is, is one order of magnitude. From 10 to 100 is another order of magnitude. To go from 1 to 100 is two orders of magnitude. This is an important concept to understand how we ensure that um, the water is safe for consumption for both types of, of drinking water. So this table is showing you the microorganisms that are deemed important that we need to test for. And viruses is a broad category. Some of them will be pathogens like harmful to humans, and some of them will just be um, viruses that would not affect you. Um, Giardia and Cryptosporidium are both pathogens for humans that we're particularly interested in ensuring we remove. So the the last column there, the conventional drinking water treatment column is showing you the log reduction values for conventional drinking water. And you can see they're like four, three, and two. Now I'll add in potable reuse here, and you can see that they at least double for most of these um, different microorganisms that are tested. This is for Texas, like proposed um, log reduction values. And uh, you can also see, remember that this is an order of magnitude estimate to go from four to eight that's four orders of magnitude, not just four, you know, linear numbers. And then finally, another reason why we might consider potable reuse is like, especially El Paso, we don't really have seawater as an option, but there are a lot of different communities that you might think like, why aren't they using seawater or salt water? Um, the carbon footprint for seawater desalination is actually three times higher than using wastewater. And that's just because seawater is really saline. It includes a lot of salts compared to wastewater. And so when you're using something like reverse osmosis, it takes a lot more energy to push it through that membrane. And so that's what you're seeing here um, in the first column. It's source, seawater or wastewater. Energy is the second column, and it shows you 3.3 compared to 0.95. That's You could see those are kilowatt hour, hours per meter cubed of water. And then the cost is in the last column. And so that ranges from 50 cents to $1.80 for seawater per meter cubed, and then 45 cents to 75 cents for wastewater per meter cubed. I also want to add this is a bit of an aside, but bottled water would be $320 per meter cubed, just so you all know. And it could just be tap water that's put in a bottle. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, I have a question for Camila. Camila, if uh, there are so many advantages to implementing direct potable reuse, why are there barriers to public acceptance? So thank you for the question, Yvonne. And I would like to talk a little bit about some studies. And there are a lot of people actually investigating why people sometimes they're not very accepting of this technology, even though we, we have so many advantages as Lauren just described, it can be cheaper and it can also be safer because we are making sure that we are removing all those pathogens. We have this whole multi-barrier treatment in place. So we, we have so many steps to make sure that that water is going to be safe to drink. But um, I would like to start with a study uh, from uh, uh, Patrick and Aj and co-workers from the University of Mississippi. So this is a, a work that they did um, uh, through a survey. Uh, so they asked a lot of people around uh, different states of the Southeast United States um, about their perceptions on uh, recycling water. And their goal was to investigate the public perception towards water we use. And that's focused on uh, the US Southeast so they interviewed 203 residents of the Southeast, including different states. And most of them, uh, their age was between 18 and 60 years old. And most of them held at least high school diploma. And the way they were able to recruit these participants was through social media. So um, I just want to say that maybe one of the weaknesses of the study is that uh, because they use social media, social media to recruit participants and uh, they might have selected people that were somewhat more educated than the general population. Also that shows uh, on uh, based on the education level of the people they interviewed, which is a little bit above the average of the country. Uh, 
but still they, they were able to get some very interesting results. So uh, one of the question they asked was kind of similar to the question that we used to start this panel. So where is your water coming from? And what you can see here is that uh, around 57% of the participants had an idea of where the, their water was coming from, but other, the other 43%, they just didn't know where the water was coming from. And when, when, uh, when they asked, who do you trust when it comes to provide information related to drinking water? And most participants said that they trust EPA and they also said that they trust academia. However, when they asked like, what are the least trusted organizations to provide information about drinking water? Then uh, people said that social media and local businesses owners. So this is something that can give us some hint of how we want to make the public aware of water recycling and uh, also direct potable reuse. So knowing who people trust, then maybe we should know who we should use to spread the information about that. And another question that was asked was, uh, what are the top reasons for opposing water reuse? So uh, some people were not willing to use water that was being recycled. And some of the reasons were that the, the chemicals used in the treatment process cannot be completely removed. And also, they, uh, people were worried about all the toxins and, uh, and chemicals that cannot be removed in, from the water even after a series of treatment processes. Some of them were unfamiliar with the wa water quality standards. Some people were unfamiliar with water treatment processes. And mostly people were concerned about potential for human error in treatment processes. And for those who supported water recycling, then the, the main reasons were, so first, um, make use of available technology, and also tr that the water was being treated naturally and in facilities. So uh, this study was not for direct potable reuse, but it's for water reuse in general, which could involve, for example, having the treated wastewater blended uh, just being sent to a reservoir that is used as water source. So this is going to be combined with surface water or groundwater, for example, and then it's going to be treated again. So people felt more confident if there was a, a natural process involved and not only the technology that was being implemented to treat the water. And also uh, if people knew that this process has been used safely elsewhere, then they were more likely to support water reuse and also if they knew that they had limited water supplies, so maybe that's not even an option, but they it's something that people will have to be okay with. And, and finally, um, they, because people knew that this is a sustainable water source during droughts. And this is something that uh, I should mention that if we think of uh, wastewater as a source of water, then we can see that this is something very sustainable because we always have a steady production of wastewater. So as Yvonne showed, here we have a very diverse source of water. So we have surface water coming from the Rio Grande, but that's not through all the year. But we have it for a few months, but we don't always have it. And same thing with groundwater, because we know that if we use too much of the water, then the levels of the water in the aquifers are going to go down. However, wastewater is a more reliable source. So it's considered very sustainable. And going to the last question of the study, so um, reasons that would make participants confident enough for water reuse. And some of these reasons, there were other reasons, but I selected the, the ones that um, most people agree with. So uh, it's that the selected treatment produces water that is up to drinkable standards. And also that the water is tested constantly with online sensors so this is something that is usually implemented when you have an advanced purification facility. We have some online sensors to make sure at all times that we are achieving our treatment standards. And also um, the water complies with 
strict state and federal drinking water standards. So that made people more confident about using reused water. And the water quality will be strictly monitored. So uh, as Lauren said, for pathogens, there are more strict standards for, um, for pathogens, for example. So uh, we know that there is uh, a lot of concern about making sure that this water is safe and that reflected on uh, people's confidence to, to use recycled water. Well, now after having heard the, uh, you know, what is direct potable reuse, uh, we're putting here a question uh, for you, for which activities would you consider using water from direct potable reuse? Irrigation, flush toilets, laundry, showering, drinking, all of the above or none of the above. So we ask for your sincere response here. And I will leave the poll open, but uh, would it be, you know, um, appropriate for someone that has responded to let us know what are your concerns uh, regarding the use of water from direct potable reuse so we can try and address them? Uh, I don't know if you can unmute and, and state it or put it in the chat. Would anyone care to share uh, any concerns from the public uh, attending in person or online? Um, well, I kind of have a concern or maybe a question more likely. Um, yeah. So I think that maybe to the public, this can be a very taboo kind of thing, especially mm -hmm. when the marketing labels come out, which I think has happened in the past many times. Um, so I think a good way to make people kind of accept uh, these new ideas or, well, they're not new, but at least this new implementation here in El Paso, uh, would be to have data transparency, right? Mm -hmm. So I yeah. believe El Paso Water already has reports every year of their water quality at different supply sites, uh, but they're not really that readable for the public. They're big mm -hmm. tables of different chemicals, hard to read, right? So uh, what strategies can El Paso Water or, or the local government implement to, to convey this information? Mm -hmm. When you say marketing labels, what do you mean? Well, I want to say one that was kind of common a few years ago, which was from toilet to tap, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And, and that kind of had a very negative sense to the public, right? Instead of labeling it as uh, something like um, uh, recyclable water, which is kind of uh, has better coming in acceptance into the public, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. that's why we were like hesitant to use that term in, in as we were discussing this presentation. Thank you so much for, for your comments. We appreciate it. Anyone else cares to share? Oh, here we go. <laughs> um, thank you. I was curious about, I think one of the things you said was that the treatments for the direct postable reuse are actually better than the treatments that most of our drinking water receives. So then I guess my question is how much of our water can be put through these higher quality and like better technology systems so that all of our drinking water meets the higher standards? 
I and like know. how much how much of our water supply would come from direct potable reuse well i i'm i'm going to let lauren respond but um i think you know one of the things that we have is in El Paso, I think we generate about 140,000 acre feet of water. So with the direct potable reuse, I hope we can augment that by 10,000 uh, acre feet. And uh, I don't know if uh, we have someone from El Paso Water that can give that precise information, but just know that the water from El Paso Water is treated to safe drinking water standards. So they're in compliance with safe drinking water standards. And, and so the direct potable reuse has a higher standard to make sure that, uh, you know, there's not any unintentional uh, release of any pathogens in the water because of the source of the water that's used. So whenever you have regular source of water like groundwater or surface water, then the level of treatment is not as intense, but uh, I don't know if we have someone from El Paso Water that can help answer the question of how much direct potable uh, reuse water we'll have in El Paso in the future. Hello, Dr. Santiago. This is Gilbert Trejo, Vice President for El Paso Water. Um, I'd Thank be happy you. to answer this question and any, any questions that the audience may have. So for the question as to how much water is being planned to be direct potable reuse water into our system, we're looking at about 5% of, of our water system. So that's it. in addition to, as um, I think it was Dr. Kennedy who, who correctly said, anytime in El Paso, there's at least in the summertime up to five different types of waters in the water system in El Paso. So we would be adding this as a sixth water source. Um, and even in the peak summertime, when we would be using this facility at full capacity, it would only be about 5%. Um, you correctly, you asked the right question because we hear this all the time after we give this type of presentation um, to our customers and stakeholders. They, they do ask about putting more of this water into the system because it is of the highest quality water we could produce. Um, I think again, Dr. Kennedy went through the log removals, conventional water treatment right now in your system, totally acceptable to drink, extremely safe, meets every single um, standard that the EPA sets um, when it goes to, to virus, crypto, and 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 uh, Giardia four four three, I believe, is the log removal four four three, and the standards that were um, that we got approved by TCQ are ten eight and six. So there's a significant, and again, in orders of magnitude, significant increase in quality of water that we're going to be producing out of this facility, and something that we're tracking internally using additional treatment uh, methods and uh, proofs that are not yet accepted by TCQ or the EPA, but just to ensure that we are going a step further, um, we believe that the treatment goals that we're achieving are actually closer to 12, 12, 10. Um, but again, because we're using alternative methods not yet approved by EPA. So you're right, this is extremely high quality water. The issue with putting more of this water into the system is frankly your water bills. This is expensive water to achieve this level of treatment is very expensive water. Um, frankly, it's being uh, treated to this level for public perception. I think we we need to ensure and, and have everyone trust that we are doing the maximum possible to produce a safe drinking water, uh, which is what we're doing. Uh, but to increase the scale of the level of treatment would just increase your water bills by that amount as well. So there is a balancing act here in terms of how much we're willing to uh, reduce the risk of any type of infection, which is really what the log removals, it's another way of talking about log removals, uh, versus the water bill. And there's a lot of consideration in terms of affordable water bills and keeping our bills affordable. So at this point, um, this is the level that uh, is appropriate. This is the amount of water that we need. It is about 10 million gallons per day that we'll be putting into our system. The 5% that I mentioned is about five, uh, about 10 million gallons per day. Um, we think that's that that's all we need right now. Um, and the cost to produce this water will be mixed in with just all the other calculations we do um, in um, determining what the water rate will be for for that year and moving forward. So long answer, but I hope that, that answers I'll just that. also add that um, the carbon footprint's also a lot bigger for the higher treatment levels. So if you are concerned about, you know, climate change and in the future, it's important to also consider that as well. 
And there's a question on the chat, and, and maybe Gilbert can help answer that as well. How will you ensure that governments will maintain the state of the art of this proposal? And I assume that proposal means using DPR. Yeah, so assuring that these that this equipment uh, gets remains maintained and optimal uh, goes down to our permit. So again, we receive a permit from the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. Um, there's a lot of sampling and testing um, to ensure that the equipment is optimized. Going back to, uh, again, what Dr. Kennedy mentioned, this facility, what's going to make it um, even more unique is the real-time water quality monitoring. This is something that does not happen in conventional treatment. Conventional treatment, nowadays, you go to any um, uh, conventional water treatment plant in the country, their sampling plan will be a combination depending on the parameter, uh, sometimes daily, but once a day, sometimes weekly, sometimes monthly, sometimes quarterly, and then sometimes a composite of different samples. Um, so there's a lot of time in between all of these samples and that's acceptable and that works, that, that works right now. This facility is real-time water quality monitoring for all the uh, important parameters that we have to ensure removal or what we're trying to remove. Uh, with the exception of the uh, pathogens, because you, you can't really monitor that real time. Um, but the chemical contaminants and the other critical control points that we're checking on, we're going to have trend lines and instruments that tell us um, constantly what are the levels of these um, uh, constituents in the water. Uh, so we'll know well ahead of uh, any breakthrough that something's not right. Maybe we need a flushing, maybe we need a cleaning in one of the of, of the equipment. Uh, process equipment, but that's extremely unique to this, um, to this um, um, strategy, this treatment strategy. So that's how we would know that something's not right or that something needs to be maintained. Uh, we'll know actually uh, real time, uh, in, in real time, we'll know that something's already trending not in the right direction. Thank you so much for the question and thank you, Mr. Trejo, for, for the response. Um, and thank you, everybody, for responding to our poll. So I see that we still have some people that would not trust direct potable reuse. Dr. Walsh has a question. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. I just have a question because I know we're focusing on microbes here, but in um, water that goes down the toilet or down the drain at our houses, it also includes a lot of chemicals that are associated with pharmaceuticals and personal care products, which are of increasing concern in the environment. So I'm wondering, for instance, when we did a survey of the river water, we could find the detectable um, levels of things like antibiotics and um, other uh, drugs in the river water by the Sunland Park effluent input into the Rio. So I'm just wondering, are you going to be, if we're having all this human waste and all these humans are taking all these medicines for their health, which I understand, are you going to be monitoring for those types of compounds as well? Excellent question, Dr. Walsh. Uh, I don't know if, uh, so Laura, yeah. Go there, ahead. There's a lot of them, so it'll be very difficult, I think, to monitor them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if we could, uh, Lauren, if you can tackle the technical aspects and, and then Gilbert can add to Lauren's answer. Okay, I, I'll answer this question because this is something that I've been very interested in, the uh, removal of contaminants of concern. So just to give you all some context, we are talking about contaminants that may cause harm to human health, but they are present in water at trace levels. So that would be concentrations in nanograms per liter. And it's true, uh, they are there. Uh, we know that in our houses, we, we use a lot of these chemicals. We use cleaning products, we, we use medications, we use personal care products, and they all end up in our wastewater. Uh, so when we are treating this wastewater, there is a concern that uh, these contaminants are being removed. And I do want to mention that these contaminants are present in surface water, sometimes at extremely high concentrations. Uh, and we even have uh, one contaminant in particular, which is caffeine, that we kind of use as a indicator for um, wastewater pollution. So if you find caffeine in surface water, you know that it's from human source. So you know that there is de facto potable reuse happening there if 
uh, people are using that water as their water source. And our conventional drinking water treatment plants are not always designed to make sure we are removing all of these contaminants. But uh, when we think of direct potable reuse, we are using very advanced technology. So we start with membrane processes. So uh, we have membranes that have pore sizes that are just so small that they will end up retaining a lot of these contaminants. And even if some of these contaminants go through these membranes, then we are still uh, going to have uh, advanced oxidation processes. Uh, so we are going to use, for example, UV with peroxide to uh, make sure we are breaking down these contaminants that are still going through the membranes. So uh, there are all these technologies in place to make sure we are trying to remove these contaminants. And some of them are regulated. So uh, we have uh, minimal, uh, maximum contaminant levels for some of these contaminants. So the, the public utilities, they have to monitor these contaminants in drinking water. For some of them, we still don't have these standards, so uh, they may or may not be monitored. And there are ways uh, that, like as engineers, we, we can think of ways to monitor all of these contaminants together. So we can just measure, for example, the, the concentration of organic carbon. So that would include pretty much all the organic contaminants. You, you don't know specifically which one you are talking about, but you can see overall how these contaminants are, are being removed from water. I don't know if Gilbert wants to add anything. Are there any other questions or well, comments from, uh, go ahead. Dr. Santiago, if I could just add on to that, because I, I gave it a mm -hmm. short response in terms of, yes, we'll be monitoring, but you correctly said there, there's many. So I think there's, you know, so it's a balancing act, but before I even go there, you know, these projects are, are start with and the treatment goals all are based on the source water characterization. So there's a lot of work that is still to this day ongoing monitoring the water quality of the raw wastewater in the system. And, and this is this is true for for any water treatment plant project. Even if we we're going to use a river water, you study the raw water source. So what's in there so that then the engineers know what to take out. So in our raw wastewater, we've done, oh my, so we started this project in 20, 2013, 14. So we're amassing a big data matrix of what is in the raw wastewater in, in, in El Paso in this sewer shed. So we know what's in there. So in addition, so what were we looking for? So we were looking for, uh, again, just to establish the baseline. A lot of this is residential wastewater with the typical household uh, chemicals that we are to expect. Um, in this sewer shed in El Paso, in, in this east part of El Paso, there's not a heavy industrial presence. So we we understand we do we have industrial um, dischargers, but even then, you know, the Clean Water Act, just the way municipalities, when we clean wastewater, we have to match or exceed the receiving stream, just like um, the, the doctors mentioned. So Clean Water Act says. You, if we treat a wastewater, we have to at least meet or exceed the quality of the river, of the lake, whatever that is, whatever you're discharging into. Same way, industrial dischargers have to match at least the, the quality of the raw wastewater in our system. So they cannot contaminate our raw our, our wastewater system. We have a whole pretreatment program where they have permits through us, we're, we're monitor, we issue permits, and we're always checking to make sure no one, that industry is not contaminating our raw wastewater system, because then that affects the treatment further downstream. Again, this is true all across uh, the country. Now, does industry contaminate and do they do illegal things? Yeah, I'm not here to say that, no, that doesn't happen. I'm saying that there are programs in place to ensure that doesn't happen. Bad actors will be dealt with if they do do that. And there's a program in place to seek them out if they're going to be doing that type of stuff. Now, we have programs in place, and this is like a whole other part of the presentation. We're ramping up our industrial pretreatment program to ensure that this doesn't happen. Because these folks that run the industries, these folks that could do this, well, we're reaching out to them, letting them know what we're doing with this project. And they really just would be hurting themselves and their own families on top of that. So we have this type of outreach so that they really understand their role in this urban water cycle that, that we're talking about. So with that said, when we did the raw water characterization for this project, we not only looked for what we expected to find, 
you know, the household chemical type things, the industrial pretreatment companies that are in this area, we're seeking their discharges to see if anything was getting passed. But on top of that, there is a list that the EPA keeps. They call it the uncontaminated regulate, the unregulated contaminant list. So these are things that the EPA, it's just on their radar. There's no, um, there's no um, regulation against them. They just know that these chemicals are out there being used in industry, just generally, not even in El Paso, but just generally. So when we did our piloting for this project, we s looked for all of those in our system, in our raw wastewater. And then when we didn't find any, which was check number one, check number two, we, in, we tested our treatment processes for all of these. Can th we remove all of these contaminants if they were to ever show up in our system for whatever reason? And we have all the data to show that our treatment process, the full advanced treatment that Dr. Kennedy showed up on the screen that we're going to use, we can remove all of that. So this is, and all this data is available. This is the level of care that we're taking to ensure the safety, the safety of the, of the water. So um, that's kind of my answer to that. Thank you. Thank I you. just want to add real quick that it's comforting also like having worked with water utilities before that this water utility in particular is interested in that and wants to make sure that, you know, we are not like we, they allow us to do research and stuff in the water. And there are some water utilities that I've worked with in California and stuff that they do not want to do research. They don't want to know what's there. They're scared. And that is not El Paso water. So I think it's really comforting to know that in this community, they are open to doing research and figuring out like what are the issues that we should be concerned about and stuff like that. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Um, I have a question. Um, since okay, we are talking about the water in El Paso, but we are on the border, <laughs> and I'm wondering how um you researchers, but also El Paso Water, uh, how you're working with institutions and actors and civilians in on the other side of the border in Juarez and in Chihuahua, to make sure that the treatments continue that, um, yeah. Well, we share a resource of the river and the uh, International Boundary Water Commission controls uh, quantities. Uh, however, you know, the pumping of water depends on, you know, who pumps first. So it's first come, first serve. Now, having said that, there are collaborations with the Junta Municipal de Agua y Saneamiento but we're seeking to develop more formal mechanisms of collaboration to ensure that there's a communications and collaborations that go beyond the personal relationships, because I think a lot of the collaborations rely on the people involved. And so I think, uh, you know, in the future, you'll see, uh, and I think one of the presentations in this conference will have to do about the water observatory that, is one of the proposals, but uh, maybe Gilbert can speak of, of what kind of specific collaborations we have with our neighbors down south. Uh, yes, Dr. Santiago. So with um, the, our partner or neighbor sister agency across uh, the border in Juarez, so we share a lot of data with them. So it's, it's a transparent relationship where we're sharing the Waco Bolson. They have their own groundwater models uh, associated with the Bolson, we have our own. So on a regular basis, um, again, it used to be annual, but after the pandemic, we kind of disconnected a little bit. Um, their agencies and the way they run their, the way they run water agencies in general in Mexico, they have more turnover in terms of uh, their leadership. So we've reestablished our connections over at La Junta de Municipal. But um, so we exchange data, uh, long and short of it, we exchange data with them. Um, our groundwater model ha now has a water quality component to it. So we can run models to see, depending on pumping, pumping rates, how water quality is going to change. Mainly TDS and chlorides is what we're is what we're tracking in the groundwater. So we share that with them. Their their groundwater model isn't there yet, but we show them what we're doing. We have the data um, and we share it. In return, they show they share their groundwater levels, which is important for us to update our model, our models with. So, um, at this point, we we have a relationship where we have the entirety of the Waco Bolson, including in Mexico, that we run our model with. They have, and they do the same when we share our water uh, models with them as well. Um, aside from that, the the communications or the the collaboration extends to uh, different uh, communication 
uh, types, uh, collaborations they, they've recently started. I said recently, maybe within the last 15 years, maybe 20 years, started their purple pipe system. We see their purple pipe tanks, their tanks go up uh, around town. Uh, we assisted them with some of that uh, messaging. They generally just ask us, hey, how, how, what did you guys do? How do you do it? Um, we share that type of information as well. Stormwater is a big is a big um, share information share that we do between ourselves as well. Uh, just the way we have uh, major stormwater issues when it rains hard here in El Paso, they have the same thing. So we collaborate uh, with them as well. So mm-hmm. it's a healthy relationship. It's transparent. Uh, we have our contacts and and um, yeah, it's it's good. It's a, it's a positive relationship. Mm-hmm. Thank you. So I would like to move on with the presentation and maybe if we have additional time at the end, we can ask any other questions because we still have great information to share with you. And I want to turn it to Lauren uh, this time because a lot of people drink bottled water thinking that it's safer to drink than tap water. Um, Could you explain how bottled water is regulated as compared with drinking water uh, from the local utility company? Yes, thank you. Um, So I'll just say that bottled water is regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, and um, tap water is regulated by the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. And so mostly what the FDA is responsible for is ensuring that there's truthful labeling on your bottled water. So if you're getting bottled water that says it's from an RO system or it's distilled or it's from natural sources, that should be true (laughs) because the FDA is regulating it. Um, If you'll go to the next slide, though. So the FDA then requires states to actually check the quality of the bottled water and not all of them actually require annual licensing. So you could you know, get your license to produce bottled water and you might not be um, consistently updating it. Another thing is that both waters do require testing of bacteria and synthetic organic chemicals, but tap water is tested much more frequently. If you go to the next slide, an example could be that, um, or like an example that this source I, I took from made was that for bottlers, they must test for coliform bacteria just once a week, and then cities need to test 100 or more times a month, depending on how many locations they test, how big the distribution system is. But you can see that's way more frequently than um, bottled water. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, Camila, are there any recommendations for increasing public acceptance of direct potable reuse? Yeah, so again, I I want to to turn to the literature to see people who are specializing in studying how people is going to react to new technologies. Um, I want to mention some, I want to show you some information from a study performed by Scruggs and coworkers uh, at the University of New Mexico. And one thing that was interesting about this study is that they highlighted the efforts of uh, some public utilities that did a really good job at uh, making sure that people would have a high acceptance of direct potable reuse, and that includes El Paso. So um, the paper uh, discusses some of the key points that made El Paso a successful example of of a place where people are accepting of this technology. And uh, some of these points are the the longstanding educational programs that El Paso Water has had for several years. And specifically, it talks about the pilot study that Gilbert mentioned. So um, there was a pilot study that, that uh, was conducted for a few years and and all the, the treatment plan- train that is going to be implemented in the real advanced purification facility was tested for a long period and people had access to that. So um, people could go there and they could see how the technology works. And that made people more confident. So people knew they're like, okay, this is what is going on with the water that I will be drinking. And also the fact that here in El Paso, people people know that we have a water scarcity issue. So uh, there were some models in, in the past that were predicting that El Paso could run out of water. And that was around 2010. And people got scared. So people know that we need we need to be more innovative and we need to explore other water sources. And so in communities that actually face uh, droughts, then uh, people are usually more likely to accept this technology. But um, there are some keys that um, 
that we should consider uh, to make sure that people are going to uh, have a good response to the technology. So um, some of them is if the public can understand what you understand, they will probably agree with what you are doing. So this is related to the public knowing what is going on. So people being aware of what technologies are being used, uh, just doing what we are doing here now, giving you an overview of like, okay, this is how the process is going to work. This is what is going to happen to your water. Not all of your water is going to come from wastewater. It's only part of it. And this is going to be blended with other uh, waters that are coming from other sources. And also uh, the formation of a citizen advisory committee. And that should be something that happens early on in, in the project. So um, the idea is that we should have people knowing and, and getting involved with all of the steps from the conception of the process. So if a city is planning to implement direct potable reuse, they shouldn't wait until they have a whole plan in place to find out what people think of that. So they should involve the public early on. And that's something that has been done here in El Paso. And also, um, well-educated media can help to educate the population. So it, it is also important to have support of the local media. And if we, I, I was curious about the situation here in El Paso, so I spent a lot of time looking at what what kind of articles I could find about direct potable reuse. And, and I was surprised because most of the things I saw were actually very positive. So uh, I think here the, the local media is doing a good job at overall and helping people to understand uh, everything that is happening in the city. And that definitely helps with public perception. And Yvonne, if you can move to the next slide. So uh, one thing that I, I want you to notice is that you're going to find a lot of fake news and misinformation regarding direct potable reuse. So these are some examples. If you, I just did this test of going to YouTube and typing direct potable reuse. And these are some of the things I found. So I found this video that uh, that's like, oh, California wants you to drink sewer water. So this is not good. <laughs> this is We know that if people watch this video, they are going to be very scared. So this video doesn't talk about all the treatment steps that the water has to go through. It doesn't talk about the very strict water quality standards that we have for this water. So it's really focusing on the fact that the water source is wastewater. And there are some other videos of people trying uh, this uh, water that is coming from direct potable reuse and it looks like something very gross. They have the, a glass of water in the back that is like brown water. That doesn't look like the water that we will be seeing. We know that this water is going to be very clean. And again, the whole toilet to tap concept um, that you can see this cartoon that the person is like, oh, hello again. So the, the water that was in the toilet before and now is coming out of the tap. So. This is really bad advertisement for drag potable reuse, and that's something that we do want to avoid. And I don't know if anybody has ever received one of these water updates. So this is a pamphlet that um, here, uh, Dr. Eva Dimmer shared this with us. So this is something that she received. She lives in New Mexico. So uh, after there was a problem uh, with the water, I think for a few days, I don't know if anybody uh, remember that it, it happened a few weeks ago I believe that uh, there was a problem with the pH of the water in Santa Teresa and and because of that they uh, the the public utility told the clients that they shouldn't be using that water for a while and, and they were providing bottled water but again because they were monitoring the water they knew that there was a problem and they informed the public but then some people try to take advantage of that. So you will find people that are pretending to be part of the, the water utility and they are going to offer you some solutions so you can have safe water at home. So they will tell you that your water is not safe. They will tell you that they can test your water. I don't know which methods they use to test the water. I don't know if they are standard methods or reliable methods. But they will try to convince you that your water is not good and they will try to sell you water filters or some other technology. So we, we need to be careful with that. And just one thing that I, I want you to think about. Um, so 
nowadays, everybody seems, or most people seem to be okay with the idea of recycling. But we can even say that recycling is trendy. And here I have an example of this coffee cups that were made of recycled material. And I thought it was interesting the way they are advertising it. So they are saying, uh, our all new eco-friendly disposable cups are made with 100% recycled fiber that gives a second life to existing resources like used cardboard boxes. So imagine before recycling was popular, imagine in the early 60s, if you told people that you were drinking water out of a cup that was made from a material that was in a trash can before, would people have been okay with that? Maybe not. Maybe people would be like, oh, this is weird, right? Like, I don't want to drink from something that was in the trash. So um, with a lot of work, now we, we look at this cup and we think, oh, I want to buy it. It's it's good for the environment, right? So uh, it, I think there is a lot of work that needs to be done. But, but I do believe that recycling water is also going to be trendy in the future. We just need to work on how people perceive it. But um, I think it... It has so many advantages and, and I'm excited about when the day comes because I know that part of our water at least is going to be you know, treated using the most advanced technology that exists and it's going to be very safe. And I hope that this is something that you all here uh, can come out of this panel thinking that like, well, I, I can trust that we are going to have access to, to very um, pure and, drink and safe water in the future. Thank you, Camila. So after having heard all of our panelists' uh, presentations and answers, and, and thanks to El Paso Water for your attendance as well to help answer some of those questions, we'd like to know if you can share some recommendations for effective public education. So if you could just type a short answer um, so that we can get some ideas from this uh, presentation and what you've learned. So we hope to hear some of your responses. If you're too shy or not interested in texting, you can put it in the chat as well. Using social media effectively, 80% of youth seeks information on social media, yeah. You can also type some answers in the chat if you feel more comfortable doing that or even unmute and uh, speak if you're online or feel free to just speak up if you're in attendance. Digital dashboards with water quality data for citizens. Accurate information available and accessible. Going to public schools. Get positive ads on radio stations, spread positive ads on social media. Get celebrity endorsements. Do we have celebrities in El Paso? General education about water. Uh, speaking mm -hmm. of celebrity endorsements, I'm not one, but my mother sent me an article when uh, Orange County started their uh, their water recycling about how excited people were to be drinking waste that was associated with movie stars. <laughs> I'll let you think about that for a while. Um, but um, uh Dr. Madera, you had a slide where you showed uh, reasons why people were opposed. And I wondered if you had any insights about how to, about where those perceptions come from. Yeah, so um, I think a lot of the reasons were actually related to lack of information and people not really understanding how the treatment process works and also not understanding that they are 
there is a lot of monitoring going on and there are water quality standards that the utilities, they need to make sure that they can provide water that is meeting those standards. So um, yeah, I, again, I think information is what is going to help us to make these people see that what we are offering them is actually something that is very safe. And, um, I don't know, if, would, would you like to add anything, Lauren? No, I think you covered most of it, um, what I know of to be. I'm honestly, so I'll just add that like, it's helpful to come to these events and hear honest opinions about it because like, you know, we, we've we already, we work with this technology. For example, as a, as a graduate student, I was testing for microorganisms and reverse osmosis permeate at a advanced wastewater treatment facility. And I was comparing it to tap water. And for tap water, I had to filter one liter of water to be able to measure microorganisms. And guess how much I had to filter of reverse osmosis permeate just to even be able to test what was there? 4,000 liters. So like that, honestly, when I did that, I was like, oh my gosh, this is like so clean. It's almost too clean. Like we have to, you know, be careful to balance like how much additional, you know, treatment we do include. But that was how I was convinced. So it's helpful to hear from you all because we can, we've already kind of convinced ourselves. So thank you for being honest here. I, I would like to share one more thing that um, so yesterday, I see a lot of the students that are taking my class are here. So we had a field trip this week to the desalination plant. And we were able to see the membranes that are used in reverse osmosis. Uh, so there, the, the goal is to remove salt from water, but uh, the membranes are pretty similar to the ones that are used in advanced purification facilities. And when you see the membranes and you see how, you, you can really tell that there are pores there because the pores are just so small. And uh, when you read a little bit about removal efficiency for reverse osmosis, then then I think you you start to understand how that water is very very clean. And I think another thing that helps uh, for me is um, knowing about de facto water reuse. So knowing that like okay, uh, I mean I, I don't mean to say that our, our current drinking water that comes from surface water is not safe. But uh, just knowing that we have been doing it already and without much planning, but now we, we want to do it with a lot of monitoring and a lot of planning. So it, that makes me more confident about um, the direct potable reuse. Thank you. Are there any questions? I think we have about 11 or 12 minutes uh, left. I have a question from the audience. Yes. Yeah, I'm I'm curious. Um, the uh, one of the slides you had uh from Singapore had the it seemed like the the recycled water had the another name. So I'm wondering if how that went over. You know, I think it was called smart water or safe water or something like that. Water. Yeah, and um, along those lines, I'm wondering, you know, is it the percep public perception that makes uh Im that impedes the 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 potable potable water reuse does it is that what kind of hinders it or is it the the costs that that are aligned with the treatment a, a, a mixture of both or what are the what are the the things you think are impediments to this becoming more widespread um, why don't you start yeah i, I... I can think of an example. Um, I don't know too well about it, but um, I know that in San Diego, they had sort of like a failure when they started thinking about direct potable reuse. And, and that was related to lack of public acceptance. That was one of the big reasons. Uh, I think they ended up working more on showing the public how they could benefit from this water source. and. And then things ended up changing a little bit, but but I know in, in the beginning, it, it was kind of early, like maybe the technologies were not so well established yet, but there was a lot of opposition from the public. And so I, I would say that this is really a, one of the big reasons. And uh, according to some of the papers I wrote from researchers that are studying that, uh, yeah, they mentioned that public acceptance is extremely important. And yeah, of course the cause, uh, if you, 
usually this is not the only water source that you have. So hopefully the, the other treatment options that you have are going to balance it out. So the water is not going to become a lot more expensive. But yeah, I, I know people are not happy if they see that the, their water bill is going to be more expensive. Even if you try to explain why and like this is really necessary, then I, I know a lot of people don't don't know why this is happening. They just know that they are paying more for the water and they are not happy about it. So I, I would say that this is an, another important reason. Yeah, I'll just add that um, the San Diego stuff. Um, I know that they were wanted to start a long time ago with, with potable reuse, I think. I wanna say like 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, something like that. And um, yeah, that's where toilet to tap actually came from. And we've said it so many times, I'm gonna say it one more time and then I'm gonna say it. The new thing we should say is showers to flowers because it's better branding and I like it. Um, but yeah, that's where it came from because newspapers sort of heard what was happening and then took that and ran with it and started posting it. And then it delayed their progress for years. They're still gonna do CPR, they're still doing it. Like it's in the plants, but they're very carefully doing it. And why are they going to do it? Because they have water issues. Sometimes we just have to, like we, we don't have options. So um, I guess that's what I'll add to that. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Um, and thank everyone for uh, oh, the information. I don't know if I we have additional time, but there's one more question. Yes, I think we have about uh, five to seven minutes. Let me move on to the next slide so everybody sees our contact information in case we run out of time and you have additional questions, you can email those to us. Go ahead with your question. Thank you. Um, I was curious if you could comment on this, these like new, exciting, but expensive and energy intensive technologies versus putting that money into like increased water conservation. And you had that diagram of like the different water sources and conservation was like a small sliver. Um, and I'm curious about conservation versus and, and the money being rooted towards water conservation versus technologies. Well, it's, it's not, it can't just be conservation, unfortunately, because um, there's population growth and then there's also climate change. So there's like several things that are impacting our water supply that are making it to where we just have to have multiple options in there and that will just make it more robust moving towards the future. I, I don't know if El Paso Water wants to comment on this. Yeah, so, so conservation, the, the growth of our conservation program in El Paso is still a focus of ours. But one of the things that we've gotten feedback from our own customers is that they're kind of conservation out right now. So we are... You know, in the 1990s, El Paso, each El Pasoan on average was using about 230 gallons per person per day in the 90s, 230 per person per day. Um, just before the pandemic, that dropped all the way to 128. I believe we hit 128. For comparison, Tucson is at 115, which is really, really good. Our goal is to get to that Tucson level. Uh, we, we're, we're looking at 118. Um after the pandemic, we jumped back up to about 132. So everyone got a, we feel everyone got a green thumb back home while they were, and they started to to use more water. So we regressed a little bit after the pandemic. We're at 132 right now. So 132. We want to get down to 118. Um, in doing different rebate programs, different uh, turf removal programs, all the things that we can do. Our customers have told us, you we we they feel that we've asked enough of them. They feel that they can't do anything more. That's the general sentiment right now of El Pasoans. We've done enough. Um, we, we don't think we can do anything more. So that's where we are right now. Um, but the fact is to encourage more conservation, and a lot of communities do this, and of course this is not ideal, but the water bill. You know, every time that we increase water rates, we see everyone's usage go down uh, is really what happens. So you know, over the next, so our goal to hit 118, uh, we've got it, I think, at 2040. So by 2040, we want to get to 118. I think inherently, as you all have seen, if you pay a water bill, our water rates are going up. They're going up because we have increased maintenance, increased uh, needs that we need to um, that we need to do, projects we need to do, maintenance we need to complete to maintain the level of service um, for our customers. Over time, over these next, we'll say, 20 years, yeah, there's there's going to be more increased water rates. We feel that that is going to help catch up, increase or encourage the conservation because, 
you know, as we increase bills, people find ways to use less water and maintain their quality of life um, is, is where we are right now. I think with that, I'll, I'll just say there's something to think about. So even now, 132 gallons per person per day, every day, each one of you account for 132. No one drinks 132 gallons at their house, right? So the majority of that's being wasted. It's being not wasted, but sent down um, to the to the sewer system. So everyone drinks a gallon. I think that's maybe what we all strive for, but even then a gallon. So think about all the treatment, everything that we put into the water is to wash clothes, wash dishes, and shower or irrigate your lawns all the treatment, all that money, and all the increased attention to the safety of the water, safety of the water, make it safe. Okay, but 131 gallons per day, you're using it just to wash stuff. All right, so just something something to think about. These are all the things we're, we're balancing. When we think about adding more treatment, or, or uh, I've been told, why do you guys push back? Do more treatment. Okay, but we're trying to keep water bills affordable too. Not everybody can has the luxury to pay the water bill. So there, there's a huge balancing act that we're doing. Just want to let everybody know this is this is what we're doing at El Paso Water. This is the type of stuff we're doing. Um, uh, contrary to maybe what you see in social media, people complaining about construction and potholes and all these things. Like this is really what we're doing at El Paso Water, and we have combat all these other things in the media because um, we're doing a lot of good things and we and we enjoy our partnership with UTEP and. And, and with everyone else across the country. Yeah, so so for reference, I mean, in, in projects that we've had in other countries and we have to provide safe drinking water, like in Haiti, we provide something between two to 10 liters per day per person for drinking and basic sanitation. So people can live with very little water if, if we really set our minds to it, so. Any last minute questions? I think we have five minutes. Uh, if not, uh, I don't know if any of the panelists would add, like to add uh, any final comments to wrap it up. Lauren and Camila. Uh, yeah, I would just like to thank um, Melissa and all the organization of the World Butter Week for the opportunity to have this panel. And I hope you will spread the word. I hope you will talk with other people about what you learned here today. And we we are trying to think of as scientists and researchers how we can help because we we are more than convinced that we are going to have sa safe water and we do want people to know that. So I hope this is going to help you to, if, I don't know what you, your thoughts were before you came to this panel, but if you were not very sure about this new water source that we're going to have, I hope that um, made you see a different perspective and, and I hope you will just tell other people about it and and hopefully this is going to be a, a big success when, when the time comes. I'll just add, if you do still have hesitations and you're too concerned to like bring it up here with everyone, please do reach out to us. Like we we want to talk to people about it. We want to understand concerns and and answer those concerns. And um, yeah, so please reach out. Our emails are up here. And thank you all for coming. Anyone from the audience wants to uh, make any final remarks in the last two minutes we have? I would just like to to thank you uh for this illuminating talk and for sharing your research and invite you to stay for the next events we have a binational panel where um the speakers will touch upon some of the issues that already came up right now and after that there is uh, a talk by dr alex mayer who will also uh, touch upon the issues of diplomacy and climate change and water usage in our region. Uh, I think that also your uh, your panel really shed lights on the importance of interdisciplinarity, which is one of the core values of World Water Week. Uh, definitely artists are needed to spread the word, to create uh, means to, to make all this knowledge public. I'm thinking about, uh, about what Gilbert just shared. I mean, we need to change our everyday habits. So we need the social scientists, we, we need the people in the humanities to, to um, ally with the scientists to make uh, all this amazing data and scientific work part of our, our everyday life and habits. So thank you very much, Dr. Santiago, Dr. Madeira, and Dr. Kennedy. 
And uh, please uh, get your coffee, your tea, your snacks, and uh, on to, to the next binational panel. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to the uh, organizers of, of this week, and, and we really appreciate this opportunity. And thank you, Gilbert and El Paso Water, for being here to answer questions. Have a great day, everyone.